And good afternoon, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. And welcome to PerfWeb uh, program number 55. I'd like to start off very quickly with uh, going through our housekeeping notes, if I may. Uh, the program is sponsored by Houston Extracorporeal Technologies. We are hiring, so if you are looking for a job in Houston, the, uh, I mean, I know it's not considered the birthplace, but certainly the mecca of cardiac surgery now. The birthplace, I think, was other places. I think Philadelphia can claim it, actually. Mm. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, Houston's a great place to work, great place to raise a family, great place to live, no state taxes, um, fantastic environment with a great team. Reach out to us, okay? You can do it by uh, reaching out to HET.us and send us a CV and uh, your uh, a letter of interest. We'll get right back to you. Uh, social media, please make sure that you like, follow, share us on the Facebook, the LinkedIn, and the Twitter, and make sure you give us thumbs up and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's probably the most important thing, subscribing to our YouTube channel and the thumbs up. No thumbs down is allowed. Uh, our website's perfusioneducation.com, which is our library. It's free. You can join it. Uh, membership is free. You have access to everything that we have. Uh, and uh, the only thing you pay for is if you need CEU certificates. But if you want to see what our upcoming schedule is, you go to perfweb.us. You can get to Perfusion Education from Perfweb. You can get to Perfweb from Perfusion Education. So really, at the end of the day, go to either one of those websites and you'll figure it out. Uh, yeah, and that's how to contact us. Call in number if you want to call in, be live on the air. Uh, there it is, 832-239-5358. Uh, our MediWeb app, please check it out. I need to sell, I think it's 1.95 million more. Or no, 995,000 more before I get to a million so I can retire. Um, so please buy our app. Uh, give them as Christmas presents. That's coming up, birthday presents. Uh, podcasts, uh, you can find us on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere that you like to listen to your podcast. So there's all my housekeeping notes. I want to welcome everybody here. But now it is time for the Tammy Sparacino Journal Club, number segment number 17. <laughs> There you go. Okay. Okay. There we are. <laughs> Sabot you're a saboteur, David. You're being a saboteur today. Okay. Good evening, everyone. So, Tammy Sparacino. We all know you, Tammy. So, get yours, going. Your show. All right. David, if you want to bring up the slides. And we need to mirror, the mirror again. it again. Okay, so scroll that down right there. So hold on one. Nope, scroll, scroll up in the corner. Scroll down. Yep, hit screen mirror. It's on the left side. Yep, hit Joe's iMac or something. Apple TV nope. or? the Mac. Mac. Okay, can you do something? Talk to John. John, take the show. <laughs> it doesn't show up, guys, the computer. Hey, John, can you take the show? Yeah, yeah. What can we do? You want me to do some juggling acts? Do Come anything. What do you want me to do? <laughs> okay, just put her slides up. And the end of that. That's the end of that. I'm done. <clears throat> well, you don't have it. won't show up on here. It's a mirror. Technical difficulties with our new toys. Yeah. Yes, I've also emailed it to you. I think you just need to open the computer up, but... Okay, so while we're doing that, everybody, hello, Hi. and welcome to the show. Tammy, Tammy Sparacino, everybody knows her. John Ingram, of course, Let's everybody knows her. Problem. You're going to go solve that problem. So, Our Joe, journal. Can I, uh, can I tell you guys something while Tammy's getting that? Yeah, please. There's a big surprise today in the gem of the week for the Knowledge Nuggets. Big, oh, good. big surprise. Coming. Good. What is it? Well, well, like I told you, you wouldn't be surprised, would it? This is true. So anyway, our lecture today, or the Thomas Barracino Journal Club, rather, is on smart decisions in fluid management are worth their salt. That's the title. And it's really interesting because we're going to have some very interesting, I think, discussion and dialogue about how 
we use fluids, what fluids we use, why we use those fluids. And I think that the program is going to be a, uh, a really exceptional program at the end of the day. Okay, you have your clicker? I do. All right. Okay, so, you have your clicker. We can close that, and we're good. You, I'll, read, you know, I'll read off of this. So okay, that fun. sounds good. Okay, so sorry about that, guys. We had a new toy having a little bit of difficulties, but we'll just go the other We did way. a horrible job of ad-libbing it, too, because we, we didn't did. know what we were going to do. All right. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. So today we're going to be discussing uh, this article that was published in the Journal of uh, Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery in November of 2020. And Joe uh, went over the title with you, a very clever title actually. It's uh, by Dr. Singh and Dr. Shaw. Two easy names. Yay. A lot better than, than, than some others. Muni Krishnapa. It wasn't quite like that, <laughs> but the central message um, or theme, if you will, for this article was current evidence favors balanced crystalloid solutions for initial fluid resuscitation in critically ill patients and cardiothoracic surgical patients would likely benefit from a similar strategy. Okay, so why was this paper published? According to our authors, a lack of consensus recommendations or practice guidelines reinforces wide variability in volume replacement strategies and uncertainty endures about fluid choice. In this review, we summarize the recent literature in an attempt to provide some clarity as to the initial solution selection say that a couple of times mm -hmm. uh, for patients undergoing cardiothoracic surgery. Okay, what problems are there to be solved? This is also directly from our authors. Fluids are drugs and each solution's unique properties should guide selection in individual patients. Fluid choice is at the behest of a clinician's preference, a decision influenced by cost, cognitive bias, and encumbered by institutional culture. Emerging evidence challenges, if not confounds, previous physiological-based practice and historic tendencies. New fluid therapy studies addressing distinct populations abound and in efforts to better inform patient-specific management decisions. Okay. Oops. There we go. All right, how did they do this? Well, they already told you they're going to do a recent literature a summary. So let's get into the first one. So the first um, trial that they looked into is called the SALT trial. And this, here's a, just some fine um, uh, bullet point. Uh, what is wrong with me today? I've got the... Everything. <laughs> These are the bullet points regarding this trial, and then we'll get into the actual article. So the SALT trial is the Isotonic Solution Administration Logistical Testing Trial. It, um, it showed significantly greater incidence of MAKE, which stands for uh, Major Adverse Kidney Events, in the saline group. Mortality and renal injury did not differ between the groups. Um, proposed mechanistic association of hypo, hypo, hypercholeremia -choler <laughs> with AKI and they measured this by higher serum chloride concentrations and higher peak creatinine. More frequent need for uh, replacement renal therapy in the saline group resuscitated with large fluid volumes. Which doesn't surprise me because you're fluid overloaded now, which is not uncommon with massive fluid administration. Right. Yeah, what's wrong is that it didn't work. We couldn't mirror over to so now we're the all, thing. Uh, now we're just discombobulated. <laughs> we're going to get through it. Okay, so this is the... That's it. Thank you for being here. That's the end of the show. Okay. John, uh, we'll, uh, go ahead with your surprise. Oh, my goodness. Okay, shush. So the SALT trial was published in uh, July 20... Uh, or, I'm sorry, October 2016 in the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. And it was uh, led by Dr. Simler uh, and uh, many of his colleagues. Okay. So here is the um, sort of the commentary about this uh, subject matter. Saline is the most commonly administered intravenous crystalloid globally. 
pre previous studies of critically ill adults have suggested an association between saline uh, receipt and ris risk of acute kidney injury and death, but results have been conflicting. Whether use of balanced crystalloids rather than saline improves patient outcomes requires evaluation in a large randomized clinical trial. Okay, so here's the abstract. Um, the main objective was this was a pilot study and a cluster randomized multiple crossover trial using software tools within the electronic health record to compare saline to balanced crystalloids. So they included 974 adults uh, uh, that was uh, from February 2015 to May 2015, and basically they just looked at who received saline and who received um, either plasma light or uh, lactated brainers. And then what they did, they looked at the primary outcome, which that was the difference between the study groups in proportion to the isotonic crystalloid administration that was saline, and the secondary outcome was any major adverse kidney effects within 30 days or make 30. So their main results um, were saline made up a larger proportion of the isotonic crystalloid given in the saline group than in the balanced crystalloid group and MAKE30 did not differ between the groups. Their conclusions, because remember they were trying to see if this was a way to a pilot study to see if they could gather this data. So their conclusion was an electronic health record embedded cluster randomized multiple crossover trial comparing saline with balanced crystalloids can produce a well-balanced study group and separation of crystalloid receipt. Okay. So that was the first um, article that our commentators were discussing. The SMART trial, which is the more recent one, um, are you okay? It, it is the isotonic solutions in major adverse renal events trial. It was the first interventional clinical trial demonstrating outcome differences between saline and balanced crystalloid use. Determined, it determined major adverse kidney, thanks, major adverse, thank you, kidney events or makes, we're just amateurs today, <laughs> directly correlated acute uh, kidney inju injury path pathogenesis with chloride levels. We're going to get it right here I'm shortly. I'm glad you asked if I was okay and you didn't just hope that I would fall over and die. <laughs> This is where the SMART, tri SMART trial was published. March of 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was uh, by Dr. Semler and uh, his, many of the same actual uh, colleagues. T their, um, their objective was to determine the effect of isotonic crystalloid composition on clinical outcomes in critically ill adults we conducted the isotonic solution in major adverse renal events trial, or SMART, which compared the use of balanced crystalloids with the use of saline in patients in the um, medical and non-medical intensive care units. We hypothesized that the use of balanced crystalloids would result in lower overall incidence of death, new renal replacement therapy, and persistent renal dysfunction than saline. their abstract. Uh, just the main thing I wanted to point out here is that um, they were comparing um, uh, normal saline with lactated rainers or plasma light again. Um, and their primary outcome was that major adverse kidney events within 30 days, a composite death from any cause, new renal replacement therapy, or persistent renal dysfunction defined as elevation of creatinine level to greater than 200% uh, of baseline. their results. So they had 7,942 patients um, in the balanced crystalloid group, and 1139 had a major adverse kidney event as compared to 1211 of 7,860 7, patients in the saline group. So 
it, you can see it was um, a full 1% uh, difference greater in the saline group. The in-hospital mortality at 30 days was 10.3% in the balanced crystal aid group and 11.1% in the saline group. The incidence of new renal replacement therapy was 2.5% and 2.9% respectively. The incidence of persistent renal dysfunction was 6.4 to 6.6. None of those quite statistically significant. They didn't meet statistical Correct. Statistics. They were Correct. close, Cro right. but not quite there. Exactly. Okay. Their conclusions. Among critically ill adults, the use of balanced crystalloids for IV administration resulted in a lower rate of composite outcome of death from any cause, lower rate of new renal replacement therapy, or persistent renal dysfunction. All right. And versus lastly, the use of saline. So yeah, the, versus the use of saline, right. Lastly, this, they did not, our, our commentators did not include this trial, but it was actually going on at the same time as the SMART trial at the same institution. All of these occurred uh, or were funded by Vanderbilt. So I thought it would be interesting to also include just a little bit about this one. So this is the SALT-ED trial. It was the saline against uh, LR or plasmalite in the um, emergency department. So it compared balanced crystalloids and saline, non-critically ill adults treated in the ER, and they found no difference in the number of hospital-free days, which had to be 28 days between the groups. Their article was published in the same issue of the New, New England Journal of Medicine, and it was uh, conducted, uh, you can see it's also Dr. Simler, but uh, his colleague, Dr. Self, was the um, uh, primary author. This trial, um, the saline against LR plasmalite in the ED trial was a single center, pragmatic, unblinded, multiple crossover trial that compared balanced crystalloid and saline among consecutive uh, non-critically ill adults treated with IV crystalloids in the emergency department before hospitalization and also outside the ICU. The rationale design and statistical analysis plan were pre-specified and have been published. The, um, the trial was monitored, uh, uh, hold on, oh yeah, so it was monitored by Vanderbilt University. Okay, so a little background, it's just their comparative clinical efforts of balanced crystalloids and salines are uncertain, particularly in non-critically ill patients that are cared for outside the ICU. This just tells you they were basically looking for the exact same things as the SMART trial, but just looking at patients um, with the parameters of staying hospital free for 28 days. They looked at 13,000 uh, patients and um, they were, the number of hospital free days did not differ between the balanced crystalloids and the saline group. The mean um, hospital free days was 25 and balanced crystalloids res did result in a lower incidence of major adverse kidney events within 30 days, 4.7% uh, versus 5.6%. Okay, so their conclusions were among non-critically ill adults treated with IV in the, um, in the ED, there was no difference in hospital-free days between treatment with balanced crystalloids and treatment with saline. So a little contradictory. Right. Right, exactly. Um, even though the differences in the SMART trial, they were very small, 1%. I thought right. so, too. I know they had a lot of patients, so that does make the 1% uh, mean a little more, but mm -hmm. still, very small. Yeah. So let's get back to our original authors, Dr. Singh and Dr. Shaw. So what were their conclusions about the SMART and the SALT? Their conclusion was adult cardiac surgery patients' IV needs are likely best served by a balanced crystalloid solution supplemented with albumin when large volumes are administered. They fully accept that this recommend recommendation is largely an opinion rather than conclusively supported by the evidence. Nevertheless, clinicians must make decisions and we offer this perspective in an effort to help those who, like us, are privileged to serve cardiac surgical patients daily. All right, so that's the end of the journal article stuff, and then I thought for our discussion today, what we could do, since um, all of us here on the panel 
have a, quite a bit of experience with ECMO and um, I thought we could discuss fluid management, you know, discussions of techniques and strategies in relationship to these articles that we just went over. Yeah, well, I have very, you know, as you well can imagine, I too have very strong views and feelings about how we manage fluid, mm -hmm. <coughs> what type of fluid we use, right. and, uh, and why we use it, even if you're talking about heme and non-heme, mm -hmm. crystalloid versus colleague, et cetera, uh, or colloid, I'm sorry, colleague, colloid. Um, but uh, John, why don't you start this off with the discussion? I think that'd be interesting, because I think you have some strong feelings and opinions as well. Well, yeah, that's an interesting topic, Tammy. Uh, you guys can hear me OK, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to summarize what you just said, and this is my opinion, in two words. And those two words are going to be canal water. Canal you know what canal water is? Water that's in a canal or in a bayou, pretty, pretty gnarly, right? Yeah, dirty so, water. So if, if, if once or twice or even three times in my life I find myself uh, absolutely uh, <coughs> famished from thirst, and the only thing I have in front of me is a canal, and I desperately need to drink water. I'm going to drink that water. Maybe it's a bottle full. Maybe it's two bottles full. And if somebody asks you, am I going to live just as long and have just as many uh, you know, non-health issues had I not drank that one or two bottles of canal water, and I, you study my life, and I didn't have any long-term effect, then you're going to say, well, look, you know, it uh, doesn't matter that you drank that, 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 that canal water. This is what... This is, this is what these things are trying to look at, but this is what I want people to understand. It may not have lessened my life or caused me to have an organ failure, but at the time I drank the canal water, bottled fresh water would have been much better for me right then. In other words, at this moment in time, this canal water is very bad for me. And it would be very, very, very much better had I been drinking fresh, clean, you know, whole water. Now, am I going to have a kidney injury from it? Probably not. Am I going to die earlier from it? Probably not. And this is what you run into when you try to say, and, and by the way, how much saline did these people get initially? Because one of the studies was they initially got saline, but it sounds to me like later on in their care, they started getting uh, balanced crystalloid solutions. So, so when, how much did they get? Did they get one liter, three liters, five liters, ten liters before they were transitioned? I'm not sure the article probably was able to decipher all that. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's kind of my overall thoughts. But this is a very deep topic. Uh, you know, I'll tell you a story. One time I was watching a, a fairly new grad many years ago who we had hired, and he was off on his own, getting pretty good on his own, but I was still kind of hovering in the hallways and in the lounge and stuff. And he got called to the room. He had to, wanted me to come in and look at something. And he had been Z-buffing the patient, right? Mm -hmm. He'd been putting in liter after liter, trying to get that potassium down, uh, Z-buffing. And, and he was acidotic. You know, he's got this horrifically acidotic pH, mm -hmm. like 7.15. He mm -hmm. goes, what's going on? What's going on? I grabbed the saline bag. I said, read, on, read to me here, what is the pH of this saline? I don't think that he ever, ever did that. Mm -hmm. And the pH is 4.0. 0 to 6.2, not 7.4, 4.0. Mm -hmm. and, really, and this is an al a logarithmic scale of acidity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, pH scale is logarithmic, so it's exponential as you move the numbers away from 7.4. Mm -hmm. And a lot of light bulbs came on about how much acid, has, uh, acidotic uh, fluid that he'd been dumping into this patient in this effort to try to debuff. So I'll well, hand it back over to you guys with I those thoughts. And, and, and John, you bring up a very good point, but for, for clarification purposes, at least, and I'm, I'm just thinking out loud, I'm not, I'm not correcting you per se, I just want to have the discussion. My understanding <clears throat> is that the saline is acidotic in its pH, but that I don't believe it contains acid uh, itself, but I think you dilute, what happens is you dilute out your bicarb because mm -hmm. it's an acetate-based solution, kind of mm -hmm. like uh, Normasol and Plasmolite. You can use those, and they have their pH their, adjusted, yeah, their pH, uh, but adjusted you will still 
the, the solution is pH adjusted, but the net effect of using even a 7.4 pH fluid that is not bicarb based but acetate based will be the same acidosis from a dilutional because you're removing the bicarb with the ultrafiltration and replacing it with a non-bicarb solution. And that brings up the, the, the fluids that we use in that even though these studies were done very, these are great studies, mm -hmm. nobody studied an actual bicarb-based fluid like what you find with the Duosol or the, or mm -hmm. the uh, uh, what's the other one by Prismaflex? The, the Duosol is uh, brawn, I think, and then you have the uh, Prismasol. Prismasol, you have the Duosol, you've got all these sols. Um, and they're usually used as replacement fluid in CRRT, but these fluids are actually bicarb-based, normal physiologic fluids. And you can get them with zero potassium, because we do that, of course, when we do the hyperkalemia treatments, mm -hmm. um, and, or technique, I should say, not treatment, but technique. Um, and you're able to re use a massive amount of this fluid and you keep your acid-base balance completely normalized, again, because of the bicarb. And uh, well, I think that's something that just has not been studied. And the problem is it comes in five-liter bags. Nobody wants to hang a five-liter bag on your pump. Everybody wants a one-liter bag. It's easier to deal with, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's easier to pick up. There's a lot of things, but they only package this stuff in five-liter bags. But there's an also uh, the effect of the hyperchloremia. Yes, that that's a different with, issue. Now, now you know, you yes. can, the body is extremely, extremely adept at adjusting to a liter or two or maybe even three, you know, dripped into your IV of saline. It, it's going to reverse that acidosis very quickly, and it's going to handle it. I mean, we are salt-based creatures, right? We, every cell in our body has salt. Yeah, but you use so, enough you know, it's, it's you, somewhat if you, uh, if ordained you, and, and compatible with what our body would need, yeah. but... It's not going to be an issue if it's one or two liters, and maybe even a little more. I don't know what the number is. And that's probably why uh, the studies really couldn't show much of a difference long term, mm -hmm. because the body can handle it. But the question becomes, at what amount of liters per individual does it start to have an effect on the kidneys? Mm -hmm. uh, and I know the hyperchloremia aspect of it is a pretty serious one. Mm -hmm. If you read up on that, you'll, you, there's mm -hmm. a whole thing we could talk about on that. Absolutely, and I agree with that 100%. That is, a, that is a secondary problem associated with this. But, I mean, I have seen people get enough sodium chloride to where they become 0.9 to where they became hypernatremic. Your act sodium goes up because right. it has more right. than 140. I think it's 160 or something. Mm -hmm. So it has a net effect of raising your sodium level as well. Yeah, 100, uh, no, let's see, hold on. No, the sodium is a little bit lower, right? In 0.9? In, oh, hold on, I'm what reading. It? Uh, well, it's 109 in LR and 140. Oh, it's than that. It's in oh wait, sorry. No, no, 130 in LR and 140 in plasma light. Let's see what it is in normal saline. So while she's looking that up, Joe, let me pose a question for you. I'm, a, I'm actually asking this question. What is the motivation not 150, to give a 150, 154. Yeah, I'm sorry? Say that if again. You're, if you're a physician working the ER, ICU, or whatever, and the person needs fluid, what is the motivation to go against Mother Nature and not give a balanced crystalloid solution? What is the motivation to say to yourself, let me not do that and let me give an imbalanced Crystal uh, uh, electrolyte solution. Well, What's the you motivation? mean like sodium chloride? Like just 0.9 sodium yeah, chloride? Yeah, that's what he's asking. Why versus, wouldn't yes. you just get versus, an yeah. electrolyte balance? Versus D5W or anything else? I think it no, just depends on the... plasma light, basically. Or plasma light. I think it just... Well, I think, I think our authors, and, um, mm -hmm. they, they highlight that. And they say fluid choice is at the behest of a, clini a clinician's preference. It's a decision influenced by cost cognitive bias and encumbered mm -hmm. by institutional culture. So sure, you might I, just be at a place that that's what they do. But I think there are other reasons. If you have a patient that comes in that needs fluid that has a uh, potassium of 6.2,
You don't want to give them plasma light. That's got potassium in it. And by the way, the sodium of, of 0.9 sodium chloride we just discussed it is 154. 154. So that's the reason why you get a net gain. Yeah. Um, I said 160, but it's 154 mm -hmm. first to be more specific. So I think that you have to take that into consideration. If you have somebody that comes in DKA, do you want to use D5W? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think about... you have to look at every the totality, and even if even the the bicarb based solutions have glucose, they have magnesium, they have calcium, they have now you can get them with various different formulations, but they're all and of course they are more expensive. So yes, mm -hmm. sodium chloride is a ubiquitous fluid. It is about as natural as you can get with the exception of the elevated sodium. It's just salt water. Um, and it is the foundation of what we're built off of. Um, and so, you know, I think that it's just a fluid that's safe. Um, but I think it's only safe in, 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 in doses that are appropriate. I think when you start exceeding those doses, now, if it's an emergency, it's shock. You just need a blood pressure, and you don't care if you have one that's Kool-Aid or one that's you know blood before you can get the blood. You have to do what you have to do. I think you have to look at the circumstances, everything individualized. If we just circle it to our field, stay out. You know, We go to the emergency room maybe for ECMO initiation mm -hmm. or, or something like that, but basically we don't live in an ED. Um, we may live with ED. Some of us, some don't. Um, but we don't live in the ED. Um, we live in the ICU and we live in the, uh, in the operating room. And I think as far as perfusion is concerned, I think using plasma light is okay as a priming solution. I think, you know, for our routine cases that are not exceptions, um, I do believe that we probably should be using a bicarb-based solution. But it is an incremental increase in cost. Uh, and again, the five liter versus one liter bag makes it a little more challenging. Well, but most people add bicarb to their prime anyway. Yes, but then you're. But then again, you you add bicarb, and you can. But sodium chloride is not a physi. It's not a a normalized physiologic fluid. It's a physiologic fluid, but it doesn't have calcium, magnesium. It doesn't have all the stuff. Right. No, I absolutely that we're agree. Used to we it should having. be using an electrolyte balanced solution yeah. if available. Mm -hmm. But to your point about using a bicarb solution, most perfusionists probably add bicarb even to the mm -hmm. electrolyte balanced prime. I Absolutely. Would, yeah, I, that's probably very true. So that's very true. So, I would agree with so that. So have any of you guys ever worked at a place or seen somebody who primes the pump with just saline? Um, yeah, I've seen it before. I've seen it before in renal patients, actually, is, mm -hmm. is when I've seen it. Mm -hmm. to, avoid the, uh, to avoid giving any potassium. Mm -hmm. I have seen that. I don't think it makes any sense. I would rather just provide Z-buff on pump mm -hmm. or CVVH postoperatively or even intraoperatively to hook it up to the pump and just use it that way. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. But that's when I've seen it, and that's the reason that mm -hmm. it was given. Was yeah, to avoid the potassium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And then so, lactated so, ringers, you is, can't just give that if you have a liver problem, right? Mm -hmm. You have to avoid lactated ringers in, in, in hepatic failure. So you wouldn't use it for in that circumstance. I mean, I think that fluids, there's a lot of different fluids for a lot of different reasons, John. That's what I think. Well, fluids well, are exactly. drugs, right? Yes, fluids they, are drugs. They are. Well, getting back to more narrowly focusing, what, let's talk about fluid management on ECMO. What, what we kind of deviated from that to talking more generally, but John, what what are your uh, what do you see in your practice when you you just need some volume to give to the patient? What are what are you doing uh, for your ECMO patients? Let's well, let me step a, take a step back. Right, you guys have all seen this a thousand times. If ECMO patient needs ECMO, the first thing they are is terribly fluid overloaded, right? Mm -hmm. Because the people have been trying to sustain them, keep their blood pressure up. They've been pouring in the fluids on the floor most of the time. That is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, saline or like LR or something like that. They generally don't have a ton of albumin and stuff. But anyway, so you get a patient already that is uh, interstitially, you know, very full of fluid most of the time. Could be intravascularly dry or maybe not. But either way, they're overloaded many liters most of the time, as you guys have mm -hmm. seen. So, you know, we will stay away from 
crystalloid as much as possible because we'll go with albumin and blood and then try to get that CRT machine uh, on as quick as possible and start trying to correct things and start trying to pull fluid across. And as fluid comes across, you can, um, uh, you're diluting some of the albumin you're giving. And so you, we, we always go to albumin first and second, first choice, second choice, before we start going to any, you know, crystalloids. Usually the crystalloids come in, patient's crashing, we need to pressurize it in. You can't pressurize albumin because it's in a bottle. Mm -hmm. So the crystalloids usually come in in our institution when uh, there's a crash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Mm -hmm. And what do you find your CRT trigger is? is? Are you automatically ordering CRT on all your ECMO patients? Or are you waiting till renal comes by and they, they anticipate a problem? Oh, we don't wait for renal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, 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 um, if we have a fluid overloaded patient uh, that comes in, you know, from another hospital 15, 20 liters over or thereabouts and, you know, maybe more, that's just what we're being told, um, we're going to uh, start aggressively trying to dry the lungs out and try to get some, some fluid moving over because if not, you know, the patient's never going to survive off ECMO. Mm -hmm. So right. we start that process. Now, we don't put everybody on uh, CRT, but it's probably 85 you know, 90%. And if somebody is, you know, relatively, um, you know, let's say they're cardiogenic shock and they have good, you know, urine output, good kidney function, we'll let their kidneys do, do, do the work. And as long as they don't have, you know, uh, 15 liters to take off, um, and maybe they're just, you know, five or eight liters overloaded because of what's happened to them in the OR or what have you, you know, we'll let their kidneys do the work. And as long as their kidneys are really cranking out, maybe we give them a little diuretics, uh, then we won't we won't use the CRT. But the minute that um, they need a little bit of help, we're, we're gonna we're gonna look into CRT pretty pretty quick. Now, mm -hmm. when you say need a little bit of help, are they is that, are they? I'm trying to get to a problem that we've run into sometimes. So that's why I'm trying to see what your opinions are on this and what's going on um, in your institution. But are are they waiting until the um, the urine output has really cut down almost to nothing. They've already tried Lasix. I mean, what, what's, I'm trying to get to when you guys, since you do it on about 80-ish percent, when are you doing, what's the, what's the trigger that you're gonna go ahead and get CRRT? Or what are your triggers, I yeah. guess, specifically? Well, so um, fluid overload, you've already mentioned that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're giving someone diuretics and you're getting a minimal response, you're not able to pull fluid across into the intravasculature and, and you don't see any improvement mm -hmm. and they keep taking fluid more in than that's coming off mm -hmm. and the kidneys can't handle it, you're not going to get anywhere with drying out your lungs, go in that direction, then we're going to help the CRT. And I couldn't define to you in black and white exactly, mm -hmm. and maybe we have one and I'm not aware of it exactly black and white. I think it's a little more vague mm -hmm. than an exact, you know, black and white thing, but I could look into that at our institution, talk to the, uh, the CRT people exactly when they get called. Um, but uh, what was the uh, quandary that you were saying you run into? Well, um, you know, I, I think we see, of course, that most of these patients are fluid, fluid overloaded, and, you know, we're having problems flowing with the ECMO, but they're not necessarily in any kind of renal failure yet, but we're giving fluids. We're still having volume problems, so you know the fluid is just leaving the vasculature. And they're and, puffing up, right. And yeah, and they're just getting puffy, but sometimes we get resistance depending on, you know, who is rounding, because they always have to consult renal before we get CRRT, so mm -hmm. it kind of depends on who's rounding if we're able to just say, hey, you know, we're on ECMO, look at what's happening here, they're not really responding to the fluid resuscitation because it's just going over into the tissues, can we get CRT? And sometimes it's a yes, and sometimes it's a no that they're still making 50 cc's of urine a day, and so they're not in renal failure. And so mm -hmm. it's frustrating, and I was just trying to see, you know. I actually had somebody say to me one time, and this patient was on ECMO, had an impella, was on uh, four pressers, and uh, we were. It was really a. It was a, they were they were they were they were sick, mm -hmm. and I had the a nephrologist tell me, you know, do you really think? I mean, you're you're increasing risk anytime you add yet another machine. 
-hmm. And I said, seriously, Doc, I mean, <laughs> do you not see what we're doing here? I mean, I really don't think the risk of adding a CRT machine in this circumstance is going to outweigh the potential benefit. Mm -hmm. I think we should do it, like, like, do it. No, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I wish we had some sort of, uh, you know, standardized protocol with ECMO that uh, is a little less stringent on when CRT, um, you know, might be applied to regular mm -hmm. ICU critically ill patients. Because I think that the sooner that we get them on that, the sooner we get the fluid uh, overload under control, it, they really have and a better chance. And it's not chance. just for that purpose. Right. You get a physiologic homeostasis, which can't be beat. Right. You can normalize Especially the your, pH, yeah. you can clear the, the, mediators. the, the inflammatory mediators, mm -hmm. you can get your electrolytes all normalized. I mean, there's so much benefit to doing that versus just trying to hemoconcentrate a patient by whipping the kidneys with a, with that's all, that are already injured with a nephrotoxic drug like Lasix. Right, and, you but know, I mean, I suppose it depends, too, on how comfortable people are with, you know, putting this uh, on the ECMO circuit or if they feel like they are, you know, now they're heparinized and they've got to put in a different sheath or, or what mm -hmm. the situation is. But I know in our particular institutions, we don't have to have a separate sheath. Mm -hmm. We're very comfortable running it through the ECMO circuit. And so it's kind of a no-brainer to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I tend to agree. And in April, I'm actually going to be giving, John, I'm going to be giving a lecture on integrating a CRRT machine into your ECMO circuit and hopefully be able to do it through the iPad over here, which will actually mirror with the uh, computer over there. Uh, David? It was so, some really uh, neat tricks that we were going to get to hopefully use. Hopefully that'll work. We'll have to save we that. We were going to practice today, but maybe <laughs> in April when I do the, the, the talk, I'll be able to use the iPad with the laser pointer and the uh, annotations. Here, let's It'll actually work. Focus us back on uh -huh. what we're talking about here. What do you think, Dave? You think it might work? Leave our production no, staff alone. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, um, so, no, and I think albumin, I think uh, albumin. blood, I think, uh, I think we run sometimes ridiculously low hematocrits on critically ill we patients. Do. It um, used to be, like when I know. first started doing adult ECMO, it was a, uh, was a hemoglobin of 10. That was yes. your trigger. A yep. platelets of, you know, um, 100. 100. And uh, you just don't see that anymore. Nope. I mean, I'm, I'm begging for blood a lot of times at, you know, seven and a half. Yes. And these are critically ill patients that yes. are really having to struggle. And when, you're when, you're, when you consider DO2 so important and you look at all of the evidence that exists for, um, for uh, uh, goal-directed therapy and how important DO2 is, um, to have your capacity so low makes it very challenging to have the flow that you need in order to be able to accommodate those kinds of oxygen delivery needs mm -hmm. in order to actually show, to have improvement. Mm -hmm. You can keep them alive, sure. but you're just barely keeping them alive. You're not giving them that luxurious oxygenation that they need after in such a, in such a critically ill condition, which is what goal-directed therapy really suggests is the reason why you have survival benefit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I could circle back to something you said, because you came around full circle, when I said earlier, why would you give somebody a saline solution that is not electrolyte balanced when you can give somebody a balanced one? And you said, well, maybe the person is high in potassium and you wouldn't want to give something with potassium in it. And then you just said the perfect thing. When you go on CRRT, you can correct yes. the potassium. You can correct exactly what you want to correct. And therefore, when you, you can give the fluid that you want to give mm -hmm. without consequence that it's going to you know, make something worse mm -hmm. because your CRRT is far more powerful and effective to fixing all of these imbalances. And now you can give a fluid that is you know, balanced and you can give a fluid that's a hyperosmotic and your CRT can compensate for you and fix all those things, right? Right. Abs I mean, absolutely. CRT is so customizable to whatever the patient's condition is. But I'm going to share this with you. What? You're absolutely right. But these are, I mean, we're, gonna, we're, we're really going down a lot of different rabbit holes. I hope, we you are. Know, and I hope the audience doesn't mind that too much. But you have to know how to run the doggone CRRT. 
How many times have we seen patient on CRRT and the prescription that's being used is pointless? Yes. We may as well not even have it in the room. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the tool, just like ECMO. We can put everybody on ECMO. If you don't know how to run the ECMO, you don't know how to manage an ECMO patient, right. Really, you shouldn't be putting the patient well, on ECMO. Right. That goes back to having an ECMO machine doesn't mean you, and knowing how to cannulate doesn't mean you have an ECMO program. Exactly. And just because you can doesn't always necessarily mean you should. Agreed. So, John, what do you think of those, 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 those deep thoughts? <laughs> yeah, and to get back to what Tammy was trying to ask earlier about butting heads, so to speak, with the nephrologist, uh, those days are over at our institution some years ago wow. because the director of ECMO, uh, surge, cardiac surgeon, he says do CRT. We do CRT. There's, there doesn't have to be anybody approving off on it, well, you which know, is probably not the case at a lot of places. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that this is, the, this is the Achilles heel, and I have actually said this before. You, some of you may have heard from the audience. You may remember this. I know, Tammy, you've heard me say it, John that the Achilles heel of CRRT is, in fact, its name, Continuous Renal Replacement Therapy. That sounds like it should be in the purview of dialysis, which is mm -hmm. nephrology, mm -hmm. as opposed to calling it CVVH mm -hmm. or CVVHDF, Mm -hmm. which would be in the purview of intensive care medicine doctors. It could even be in the purview of a cardiac surgeon, or in your case, an ECMO uh, director of an ECMO program, physician ECMO uh, director at your institution, because what are you doing? You're managing electrolytes. Well, you know, cardiac surgeons get called in the middle of the night for hypokalemia all the time. Mm -hmm. Says give two runs of 40. Okay, that happens all the time. Um, they get called for blood pressure issues and have to make a decision whether or not it's fluid, give blood, mm -hmm. give, uh, uh, give uh, uh, Lasix. It just depends on what it is. So they do electrolyte balance. They do hematologic balance. They do coagulation balance. They do fluid balance. They do uh, rudimentary renal uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, treatments or, or, or sure. decisions based on whether they need Lasix or not well before they do a nephrology consult. So really, it's not, CVVH is under the purview of any physician managing a critically ill patient, whether it be an ECMO patient or a post-cardiac surgery patient, and in the intensive care medicine world, any patient in the critical care unit without nephrology. Now, do I think nephrologists that really understand CRRT, renal replacement therapy, are great, that are great at it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, in fact, Claudio Ronco is a perfect example of that. He is incredibly, he's a nephrologist from Italy. He's the godfather of modern CRRT. Um, and he will tell you the exact same thing that I just got through telling you about its name being its Achilles heel. And he is a nephrologist. But if you're a nephrologist who doesn't understand CRRT and you are in control of it and you're not comfortable with it, all you know how to do is dialysis and you don't want to take the time to really learn the therapeutic uh, benefits or the, how, to, how to prescribe it in the most effective manner for any one patient, then you should defer the care of the patient to somebody else that can. Well, see, I think this also, and getting off topic a little bit, about uh, I think if you have an ECMO program, you should have a director, a physician director of the ECMO programs help coordinate all these different services that are going to be taking care of this patient. Agreed. I, I know that intensivists, you know, that's really their uh, purview uh, to manage those patients, but adding on all of these additional things for ECMO is a lot more for that intensivist who is still managing the entire ICU. Right. And so right. I think having a physician partner that is really concentrating on the care of these ECMO patients Agreed. is, is you know, it helps everyone kind of come together and gives one, uh, one way instead of intensivist A is here and they think this and then nephrologist comes by and thinks this and CV surgery thinks this. And so you kind of do a lot of ping-ponging back around depending on how 
uh, well your team works together. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sure. Sometimes having multiple opinions and thoughts about something in a team is very helpful for overall uh, you know, patient care and giving patients the best opportunity. More minds are usually better than, 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 than one. However, you still have to have an overall decision maker. Right, that's my point. You can have, you can have treatment by committee, but you have to have somebody that ultimately makes a decision about what direction you're gonna go. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And, make, and sometimes these decisions have to be made rather quickly. So right. they're not decisions that can be contemplated with you know, polite hand-wringing over several days when the patient mm -hmm. needs care immediately. So that's, you know, it, it, is, it is one of the, the, uh, the, the, the problems that it, it are associ is associated with medicine. You have turf wars, you have, you know, who's, who's really responsible for this, and when should they be involved, and when should they well, be that's involved. That's what I think I see Very more. complex. It's less than turf wars, at least in our experiences, is people, the, the physicians caring for these patients, sometimes not knowing, oh, is this my decision to make or is this someone else's decision to make, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then you do a lot and of... And what's my knowledge base? What do I really know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see this as a renal problem, but is, is a, 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 an electrolyte disturbance secondary to critical illness for some, you know, other reason than a direct renal insult that's just causing a renal insult, is that really a nephrology problem? You know, what is the real problem? You have an acidosis, you know, is that a, is that a, is that a renal problem mm -hmm. or is it a heart problem? I mean, I think you have to sort of look at this, not just, well, it's, we need somebody to do dial to treat the kidneys because we have we need the kidneys to be able to get all of these electrolytes and acid base corrected. But you know um, I can't run dialysis. But you, you see where mm -hmm. I'm going with yes. this? It gets very cloudy. Yes. And I think that that's been a problem for a very long time. Agreed. So I think if you're going to have an ECMO program, even in some of our institutions that have units that have everything in them yes. and ECMO. Yes. I think, John, I think your institution has it right. And I think other institutions uh, in the country have it right. And that is, if you're going to do ECMO, you should have an ECMO unit. And that is all that unit does is ECMO. Yes. Hmm. John? You must have, you must have, you guys hit on it. You just have a lot of things, but Number one, close to the top, is whoever your critical care uh, physicians or PAs, and a lot of times it's, mm -hmm. it's PAs, they must be ECMO experts. They must be ECMO qualified. You cannot take a, an, a, a, a PA CCM individual and suddenly, for the first time ever, put them in front of critically ill ECMO patients and think that that is going to work out because most of the time it is not going to work out and um, it's a long slow road to taking care of critically ill ECMO patients and learning uh, the mistakes that, that, that are going to be made along the way compared to someone who is fully critical care medicine ECMO knowledgeable and ECMO experienced. Agreed. Agreed. Well I think we've uh, this has been a good conversation I yeah. think uh, Fluid is good. Um, you know, it's the anesthesia mantra. If the blood pressure is normal, give volume. Give, give crystalloid. If the blood pressure is low, give more crystalloid. If the blood pressure is high, give even more. So that's all anesthesia knows to do. Who are you working with? <laughs> anesthesia. Um, it's the anesthesia mantra. The only thing, the only treatment for everything, normotensive, hypertensive, hypotensive, is just more crystalloid, and uh, and damn, damn, damn the hemoglobin. So uh, I think I think crystalloid in appropriate circumstances, albumin. People have brought this topic up to me several yes. times. I will tell you that in my and I have done extensive extensive. Uh, uh, reading on this topic mm -hmm. and trying to find toxicity in albumin. I have not found 
toxicity in albumin to exist. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can obviously, you need all fluids, so you yeah. can't just replace the entire, the patient's entire fluid volume, all fluids with nothing but albumin. But if you need fluid to preferentially give albumin, is not a bad idea. Uh, you want to keep the fluid in the intravascular space as much as you can. It doesn't have a very long half-life, and it's naturally synthesized by the liver. It's very good fluid. It's something that, uh, as a volume expander, I'm a big believer in it. I don't like the artificial ones. I don't like Hess and Hedda Well, that's what I was going to ask you. What do you think stuff. about those starches? I don't like them. I don't like them. I don't see them they're anymore. Very big, they're very big molecules. Yeah, I don't too much either. Now, I've no, I know heart surgeons that use them for the, uh, for the uh, anticoagulant effect. When they do carotids, they'll give some uh, yeah. uh, to help with, uh, with uh, reducing the risk of, uh, of clot after they finish the surgery. But they have too, much, too many side effects. I just don't like them. I mean, I really haven't seen one in about 20 years. Like yeah. almost immediately after, exist. after I graduated. And I think they're trying to come out with newer iterations of it. I think Europe uses them a lot. In fact, I got a message yeah. from somebody about that. Um, I just prefer good old-fashioned albumin. Mm -hmm. That's what I like. And it's, uh, you know, it's pasteurized. It's, it doesn't, you don't have to worry about disease transmission. You're not going to get any prions. You're not, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great fluid. Mm -hmm. And it's not really that expensive. Everybody talks about the cost we of We looked albumin. it up today. Yeah. The cost is very reasonable given the advantages of just giving a bunch of crystalloids. So, you know, I'm a big believer in albumin. And then, of course, you know, keeping your hemoglobin uh, with the, uh, or I'll, I'll, I'll revise that, not just your hemoglobin through dehydration, but keeping your red cell volume of your patient appropriate for, your oxygen carrying capacity appropriate for your patient's disease condition. I think that's really so critically important. There are some people, 21-year-old trauma, that can probably do just fine with the hemoglobin of six and probably walk out of the hospital just fine, not even never get a blood transfusion. But you take 76-year-old grandma who just had a right. type 1 dissection, and I think you're in a whole different can of soup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don, any closing thoughts? I think if you um, want to look at your ECMO program and think to yourself, okay, what should be our go-to fluids to reach for, especially in the beginning, we've got a brand new ECMO patient, ballooned up 15 liters over, over maybe more, reach for albumin and red blood cells as your first two go-tos because you're going to give all this albumin, you're going to bring fluid across, your hemoglobin is going to be low, you need delivery of oxygen cap capability, and your red cells are an osmotic contributor. They contribute, mm -hmm. contribute positively to your, to your osmotic pressure, which further then brings fluid across. If your kidneys aren't cranking out fluid, give a lot of help with the CRRT, and you're going to start seeing your patient improve because your lungs are going to dry out, other organs are going to function better. Uh, you can tune your uh, electrolyte imbalances with the CRRT, and I think you'll find out that if you have a good osmotic pressure in the high normal range, and good oxygen carrying capacity, you're going to perk your patient up on a good on a good start. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Great. Tell me that was a great topic. <laughs> oh, thanks. Salt, make, salt two. Salt ED. Salt ED. Yes, yeah, well, salt ED. Salt and ED. smart. Yes. And smart. Yeah. Yeah. Really kind of cool names. I yeah. Have another, to admit. And there was also even one I didn't even cover because how long can I make this? Called the safe study, and that the has mm -hmm. that has to do with albumin, right? Oh, what did they say? I didn't read that one, but it's just briefly referenced in here. Okay, we need to we need to pull that one in. Yeah, and do well, that I, I did. I, I circled that. I want to do one. I want to do, do one of these on albumin. On, yeah, do too. Just albumin. Just albumin talk. Much maligned albumin, the greatest fluid. Uh -huh. It's it's kind of like albumin and Trump. They're sort of the same thing. They're the Are best they? thing ever, but much maligned. <laughs> yeah, I just thought I'd pass that along to everybody. Okay. <laughs> Okay, with that said, I think it is now time for John Ingram's Knowledge Nuggets. And welcome back, John. We are back. 
Yep. Yes, I'm concerned. I'm going to have to call Mike Bloomberg. We saw yep. you at the big gulp behind the camera there. They didn't see you online, but we saw you. Those are illegal return, in New York, don't forget. The return of the big gulp, the return of the big gulp. It's what keeps me going. So you, have De, you have DeSantis so as a governor, so I think big gulps are still legal in Florida. Yeah. Yep, we don't have to, uh, you know... Uh, Go to speakeasies or anything like that to get one. We can do it right <laughs> on Okay, that was pretty good. That was funny. All right, John, it's yours. Knowledge Nuggets. All right, you guys are going to love this one, I hope. And uh, okay, guys, so this is Knowledge Nuggets, episode number five. Today is March 25th, 2021. John Ingram, I am your host. And of course, with this presentation and all others, I have no disclosures and, and whatsoever with these topics so we can and, as, and our motto at Knowledge Nuggets and the reason why we called it this is because we're going to try to keep it short and sweet but help you benefit so you spend a little time and expand your mind is our motto. This week's topic fetal hemoglobin versus adult hemoglobin. Not such a deep topic. We've had a lot of deep topics in the past four or five weeks. This one's going to be a little bit uh, easier to digest. I'm not so... Uh, getting in the weeds, but I think it's a fun one, an interesting one that not too much of us have thought about probably very recently. <coughs> so as you guys know, if anybody's new at watching, our format is a different, different topic each, each week, each episode, and we're trying to give you something you can take home with you and be a better clinician tomorrow. And when you see this golden shiny nugget in the right-hand corner of your screen, that is something you can screenshot, take a photo of, It'll be a take-home slide. Hopefully, you can be a better clinician, to clinician tomorrow with that little bit of knowledge on that slide. So the format is about a 12 to 15-minute segment. Hopefully, it's highly impactful. We get right to the point. Then we follow with a surprise, something we call the gem of the week. You never know what little tidbit that's going to be. Then we follow up with panel discussions and questions. And if you guys are, are watching live or in the future, <clears throat> if you have any questions or comments, suggestions for a future show, Please email me at that email address, john.ingram at perfweb.us. And as always, I answer 100% of the emails that people send me. So I will get back to you. <clears throat> so what is fetal hemoglobin? We're going to talk about this. So here's a take-home slide. Let's define it. Fetal hemoglobin, that's the HBF. Fetal hemoglobin is the predominant form of hemoglobin in the fetus, hence its name. Hemo, he, uh, fetal hemoglobin appears in fetal blood a few weeks post-conception. So just a few weeks after you're conceived <clears throat> in your evolution, the body <clears throat> begins to develop and you come up with the existence of fetal hemoglobin. And this persists uh, at some decent level all the way through the first few months of life. Fetal hemoglobin is a four-chain polymer tetramer just like regular adult hemoglobin, and it has exactly the same alpha chains as adult uh, hemoglobin, HBA. However, next slide. Fetal hemoglobin has two gamma polypeptide subunits. Instead of in adult hemoglobin, it has two beta chains. So two gamma polypeptide uh, have, have replaced in the adult hemoglobin, what would be the beta change. This is a difference, okay? So 50% of the fetal hemoglobin has a two different chains than the adult. Now, these gamma units specifically alter the 2,3-DPG. If you recall from last week's episode, we talked about the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve and the impact that 2,3-DPG has it. So these two gamma subunits that are now different on the hemoglobin of the fetal hemoglobin um, specifically alter the 2,3-DPG effects, and it affects its binding to fetal hemoglobin as it compared to the adult. So the results of um, fetal hemoglobin now have an increased affinity for oxygen. So that's the net result of those gamma units being in place of the beta units. So what is hemoglobin molecule, real quick? Hemoglobin is a protein uh, in the red blood cells. And by the way, guys, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 260 to 280 million hemoglobin per red blood cell. A lot of people don't realize how many are in a tiny little red, red cell. And it's made up of, the hemoglobin is made up of four polypeptide chains. 
as I said, two alpha chains, which is shown there in blue, and two beta chains, shown there in red. Now, that's the adult. The fetal hemoglobin has two gamma chains replaced there instead of the two beta chains. That makes it fetal hemoglobin difference. So the structure of fetal hemoglobin, there are primary structural differences between fetal hemoglobin and adult hemoglobin, and it's located in the 2,3-DPG binding sites. These structural differences cause 2,3-DPG to bind less tightly to fetal hemoglobin compared to hemoglobin A. In other words, the 2,3-DPG cannot have nearly as, as an high an impact on the fetal hemoglobin as it does the adult hemoglobin. So this decreased effect of the 2,3-DPG, this blunted effect, causes fetal hemoglobin to have an increased affinity for oxygen, causing a leftward shift in the oxygen saturation curve. Because 2,3-DPG causes the hemoglobin oxygen uh, dissociation curve to go to the right. So if it can't have its effect nearly as much, then it causes the hemoglobin association curve to shift to the left, therefore increasing hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So now, what is the purpose? Why does fetal hemoglobin want to have this fe feature? Why is it, what is its function? The increase in oxygen affinity is beneficial because oxygen in the maternal blood must diffuse over to the fetal circulation. Oxygen transfer from the, from the maternal circulation to the fetal circulation is made possible by the fact that fetal hemoglobin has a higher of oxygen affinity. If it did not have any higher oxygen affinity, there would be very little transfer, if any, because the hemoglobin might as well stay attached to the adult hemoglobin as it passes through the placenta. Now, also of interest is that fetal hematocrit is significantly higher than the adult hematocrit in mom. Fetal hematocrit is about 15 compared to mom, which is going to be about 12. The, the net result of this is that fetal uh, hematocrit yields a higher oxygen content in the fetal blood. So another, the last part of this is that in the fetal circulation, also now, <clears throat> remember from last week, that in, in regions of low PO2, in regions of hypoxia, hemoglobin will naturally let go of its oxygen to, to, to an environment of low PO2. So in the fetal circulation, there's low oxygen tension because of the, the difficulty of getting oxygen to the fetus. There's generally a low oxygen tension, and this promotes proper unloading of the oxygen despite hemoglobin's, uh, fetal hemoglobin's oxygen, high oxygen affinity. So that's how it's counteracted in the tissues. So you have a high oxygen affinity for hemoglobin, but because there's a low uh, oxygen tension in the fetal tissues, hemoglobin readily lets go of it in those, in those tissue environments. So the low oxygen tension in the fetus is important for development. And by the way, it also promotes, low oxygen tension also promotes angiogenesis. And you guys probably know that, that when you have environments of, of low oxygen, as in, let's say, ischemic tissue, what happens in the heart? It promotes the growth of angiogenesis. So this helps the fetus develop um, as well. So it actually for, has two functions there. So now let's look at our oxygen hemoglobin, hemoglobin dissociation curve. This is the normal. Remember from last week, we have the oxygen dissociation curve with the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin along the y-axis on the left and on the x-axis at the bottom is our PO2, oxygen partial pressure. And if you have a left shift of the curve, it's an increased affinity for oxygen. You have a right shift, it's a decreased affinity for oxygen. So go ahead, Dave. So if you look at that, let's say a PO2 of 40, and the normal uh, dissociation curve would give you a saturation of 70. Go ahead. And then the fetal hemoglobin now we learned that it is going to shift our uh, oxygen dissociation curve to the left, along with those four things we talked about last week. But now we've added fetal hemoglobin is going to be shifted to the left. And what is the net result? The next slide will show you that it is much easier to saturate fetal hemoglobin's hemo uh, oxygen with the fetal hemoglobin at a lower partial pressure of oxygen. You would only require a PO2 of 30 to reach that same 
saturation of 70%. So this is what fetal hemoglobin does by shifting to the left. So here's a take-home slide on leftward shift of the oxygen dissociation curve. So the leftward shift indicates that the hemoglobin has an increased affinity for oxygen so that hemoglobin binds to oxygen more easily. The left shift of the curve is a sign of fetal hemoglobin's increased affinity for oxygen, which is beneficial for O2 transfer through the placenta. So now, if we look at the development process and the development of fetal and adult hemoglobin, if you look along zero, which is conception, at the moment of conception, on the y-axis, you have the synthesis of globin, the synthesis of the various hemoglobins. And along the bottom, you have the gestational age. And there at month nine, you have birth. But if you look all the way to the left, immediately the embryo develops something called embryonic hemoglobin. It starts off at a very high level just in the first few weeks there. And then at the same time, that fetal hemoglobin there in the green is just getting started. But as it is able to escalate up there in the first two months, embryonic hemoglobin has done its job and it dissipates rapidly down to nothing because now about month three, you have a very high concentration, almost entirely fetal hemoglobin. Well, this gives uh, a chance for the adult hemoglobin there in red that's the beta and the alpha at month three. The beta begins to mature and grow and develop. But it takes to, a, to about month seven before the alpha aspect of the adult hemoglobin is able to uh, start evolving. But by month nine, you can see that the fetal hemoglobin is dropping rapidly, and the adult hemoglobin is rising rapidly, and the alpha hemoglobin is starting to uh, bring up itself. And you see there, by month three of infancy now, the month or um, by six months old, right, uh, you have almost all of your fetal hemoglobin has diminished down to nothing. You have all of your adult hemoglobin basically has taken over. So that's the transition. So in conclusion here, fetal hemoglobin has two gamma polypeptide subunits instead of the beta chains in the adult hemoglobin, causing an increased oxygen affinity. Oxygen transfer from maternal circulation to the fetal is made possible by fetal hemoglobin having a high oxygen affinity. Fetal hemoglobin is normally reduced. Now, this is an interesting fact, guys, that one reason why I actually chose this topic, because I found this to be a fascinating fact. Fetal hemoglobin is normally reduced to less than 0.6% of the total hemoglobin in adults. It doesn't totally go away. Adult population has somewhere between 0.3 and 4.5% fetal hemoglobin. I find that fascinating that even as adults, we have a, a, a few percentage points of fetal hemoglobin that stays in our system. Hmm. So now, the gem of the week, here we come. So you guys know that the gem of the week could be anything that I select it to be. It could be some interesting trivia question that we could discuss. It could be something about how to conduct an interview or even a virtual interview now and getting a job. It could be about a great job offer or career opportunity that's out there, like Joe mentioned in the beginning of the show with Houston Extratorial Life Support. And then you have a Profusion Technology, sorry, Technologies. <laughs> you have Profusion News, something in Profusion News. Uh, you could celebrate something going on interesting during Profusion Week. We could take a quote, which by the way, I think we did last week, a famous quote from Albert Einstein. We could even talk about an upcoming meeting like the New Orleans Conference for Houston Extratorial Technologies coming up here in a uh, few weeks, right? Mm -hmm. So this you might. episode, uh, that's the, April, the, week, the big surprise yeah. is we're going to talk about March 25th, today, remarkable events, this date in history. And by the way, that's my <laughs> birthday today. <laughs> Happy birthday, John. Happy birthday, today, John. I am 6-0, the big 60. Wow. Happy 60 birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. So today being my birthday, I thought we would look at famous things that have happened on March 21st, in 1668, on March 25th, excuse me, the first organized horse race took place in the United States, 1668. On March 25th, in 1896, was the very first Olympics in Athens, Greece. In Athens, Greece, 1896, the first Olympics started March 25th. <clears throat> in the year 31 AD, March 25th, has been determined to be the very first Easter that ever was conducted. And 
the famous Scythian monk Dionysius Exegus, who is credited of researching his entire life to figure out uh, when things occurred. He's the, credited with being the creator of the Christian calendar, determined that the first Easter ever uh, occurred on March 25th, 31 A.D. On um, famous birthdays, the famous Aretha Franklin was born March 25, 1942, and the phenomenal Elton John was born on March 25, 1947. The uh, famous actress with Sex in the City, Sarah Jessica Parker, was born March 25, 1965, and for your NASCAR fans, the famous first woman NASCAR driver, driver Danica Patrick was born March 25th, 1982. So now let's look at, today, Joe, March 25th is International Waffle Day. Why do we have waffles? It is also National Pecan Day, National Pecan Day. It is National Lobster Newberg Day. Now, doesn't that look awesome? It does. So now let's get something more relevant to our topic today. This day in history is significant medical history. Born on March 25th, 1863, was a guy named Dr. Simon Flexer. Dr. Flexer was an American pathologist and a bacteriologist. And in 1899, Dr. Flexer isolated the bacterium Shigella dysenteria, which is the bacteria responsible for dysentery. In 1907, he developed the curative serum for cerebral spinal meningitis. Amazingly enough, in 1911, he discovered the polio virus antibodies, which without this discovery, you could have never had a cure. But ironically enough, he discovered the antibody in 1911, and some uh, 42 years later, that discovery led to the cure of polio uh, on March 25, 1953, by Dr. Jonas Salk. And so, guys, that's today, March 25th in history. If you guys have any questions, comments about today's show or previous shows, please email me at that email address, and I will respond back to you. And so today, that's our panel discussion coming up, fetal versus adult hemoglobin. And today, March 25th, famous days in history. Your birthday. Congrat very good, John. Congratulations. <laughs> Great you have a, do you have a happy birthday uh, thing over there, David, that you can just push the button and make it sound something? <laughs> yeah, I we need too. to get one. Yeah, you can't keep things secret. So I had, a, I had a one specific question for you. Are there any disease states that um, are, 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 are the cause of someone having a higher level of fetal hemoglobin in the adult than the 0.3 to 4.4 percent that we all normally have. Well, I I didn't see anything on that, but what's really interesting on that slide where I showed the development of the different aspects of hemoglobin, when you have anything at all that goes slightly amiss with that development, this is how you end up with all of these pathologies. For example, sickle cell oh. anemia. And all of your, um, uh, you know, red blood cell uh, uh, anemias and things like that that you have, and it goes into all the different ones, are spawned from the from the maldevelopment of those of that chart that I showed in that graph. If things don't evolve according to like that is, and you have some perversion of it, this is how you end up with those various blood uh, pathologies that we all know about that are based on you know, people having difficulty with unknown anemias and, mm -hmm. and, and sickle cell being by far the, uh, the, the, the common, and that's why it's genetic, by the way, too, right? Sickle mm -hmm. cell anemia is heavily genetic, and you'll see there in the genetic development where things could have gone a little wrong. Now, that's a huge, huge topic, by the way, to dive into hemoglobin evolution and genetics, which, uh, you know, we could dedicate way, way a lot of time to that. But this is the birthplace of all of your you know, hemoglobinopathies. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Very good. Do you have any questions? I do. I actually was interested in the same topic, um, but going a little bit different direction, about adults who have varying percentages of uh, the fetal hemoglobin. I wondered, is 
that's something that's static with an adult? Do you always, you know, if you're on the higher end, let's say you're the 4%, are you always in that state? Mm -hmm. Or is it something that can change with age or, you know, particular um, uh, physiological situations? Do you know that's anything about question. that? Well, you know, um, that's a good question. Like over time, if you, let's say you started off and you were in your, I don't know, teens or 20s mm -hmm. and you had 4%, did you, would you whittle down to, you know, 1% when you get to my age or something? That's a good question. But here's, here's the interesting thing. You know, the life of a red cell is 90 days, right? So your body, if you're maintaining a certain percentage of fetal hemoglobin, you're doing that. You know, you're repeatedly doing that all the mm -hmm. time because your red cells, you know, they're dying off by the by the millions a second and you're making new ones. And so for whatever reason, you're continuing to, um, to produce a certain percentage of fetal hemoglobin sure. in your system, which, you know, by the way, does have a higher affinity for oxygen. So, you know, maybe uh, over evolution, there was some uh, benefit when people lived in the mountains or something like that in lower oxygen sensitive well, environments where they wanted to, to you know, evolutionary wise, your body said, you know, maybe we should hold on to a little bit of this because, you know, maybe it's beneficial to us. So maybe That's there's exactly where something I was back going in with those this. lines we could look mm -hmm. into. I wondered if um, thinking about athletic abilities, certain athlete types, mm -hmm. um, maybe they have a different level of fetal, he fetal hemoglobin. I don't know. That's a very that's a very good question. So that's where I was going with that. Some of these, you know, certain people in the prime of uh, mm -hmm. health, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, teens to you know probably early adulthood. I wondered if maybe that's uh, uh, something to do with some of these really uh, high star athletes who are able to do some things that the rest of us aren't. Yes. Does that increase your DO2 max? Right. For example. Exactly. That's because what I'm getting at. You know, and I do have to say this as well, since you are you're asking because you're an athlete yourself. Mm -hmm. may, you may not know that in the at the audience. And uh, you are going to be in a race this weekend, as a matter of fact. So I wanted to wish you luck oh, thank you. in your race this Saturday. Why don't you tell us about it? Um, well, it is a relay race celebrating Texas Independence Day, which has already occurred. But this, um, this race always occurs at the end of March to signify this. It didn't occur last year because of uh, the pandemic. But they are going to go ahead and have it this year. And um, it's 187 miles. Uh, uh, run over, um, it kind of depends on how fast you are, but within a 24 to 36 hour period uh, between 12 runners. And, and what, where's the, so it's that far, but between what cities? What, this year it is uh, going from Gonzales, Texas to Brenham, where Bluebell ice cream is uh, manufactured and from. Uh, they need to stay away from that listeria. They do. Mm -hmm. um, normally it ends in Houston, but because of the restrictions with uh, COVID, they're not allowing uh, the race to end here. So normally it's a 200 mile race, but this year they had to alter it a little bit. And so they made it kind of fun, 187 miles to signify the 187th anniversary of Texas independence. Very good. Excellent. Very yeah. good. And, and how far will you run? Me personally, I'll just run about 17 miles. 17, just about 17. Just about. One time? No. It's broken up into legs, so there's 36 legs of varying degrees, uh, varying uh, distances, rather. And uh, you can run your legs all together. We chose to separate ours out, so um, you're basically awake for your 24 to 36 hours traveling, uh, you know, dropping one runner off at their leg, and you're traveling to your next leg and resting in between and so on until you finish. We'll start the race together, run the first mile, all team members. And then everyone will run their um, respective legs. And then for fun, we're all going to run the last leg uh, with the last runner so that we can all cross the finish line together. Very good. Excellent. Yeah. Very good. How many miles total is that, Tammy? How many total miles? Um, this year it's 187. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, um, my, my call my home uh, Key West. And if the very beginning of Key West is Key Largo, and that's uh, 100 101 miles exactly, and they do the same thing. Oh, that's they take fun. a team of runners once a year, and it's about a 24-hour thing, mm -hmm. and everybody does, I think, two miles, and they drive, or five miles, whatever mm -hmm. the team wants to do. Right. And it's a big, long ordeal to, to make it with, with what you're talking about because uh, it's, a, it's, it's pretty amazing, the teams that they do, and they, they decorate the cars, they get team names, yes. they do a lot of fun stuff. It's amazing. Yeah, we have a theme song and, you know, a <laughs> motto, and, like, they go all out. 
Can I, can I just, for fun, say something? Yes. So we could stay awake for 24 or 36 hours for a, for a, a marathon run, but we, but we can't stay up 24 or 36 hours to take care of an ECMO. <laughs> I've done that before. I, I, I've I done it. I just thought, I just wanted to mess around. I'm, I'm sorry. I couldn't help myself. I knew you that were was going more there. For, that was more for some other people. Um, but, uh, John, I have to criticize you on one thing. And, yep. uh, and I think you, you definitely deserve the criticism. Um, and that is you cannot say um, mom. You can say the fetal carrying unit. Uh, You're not allowed to say mom. I haven't actually read that. You're just being salty. Yes, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. Okay, so it's the fetal carrying unit. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Anyway. Yeah, I just thought well, I'd throw uh, it out there. Well, I guess, I guess, I guess we can dispense with all the uh, gender-based holidays then, can we not? Yes. Because now you don't have any. No, uh, you have the fetal said. carrying unit day. Right. Exactly. Happy fetal <laughs> carrying unit day. That thing I'm not have giving that. up my women's month. It's right. women's month. Exactly. No, no, nope, can't have women's month. I claim womanhood. I'm in the women's month. I want to uh, get. I want a present. I want a gift. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, you know what? In fact, I'm going to start a new program called the 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 new women in perfusion. I know there's the women in perfusion, but I'm going to do the new woman in perfusion. John, it was an excellent topic that actually I haven't thought about in a really long time. And so thank you for um, bringing this up and educating us, because now I have a real interest in those people that have higher fetal. Yeah, I think it's something we can look into a little further. I don't know anything about it. So, you know, this was fascinating to me as well. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed yours. I really, I think we all have a passion for fluid balance and fluid administration and understanding what we're doing. So this has been a great program. Um, not Started out a little rough. Not with, notwithstanding the technical difficulties, we'll figure that out later. Um, after the program's over and, and, and after the cameras go off and the mics go off, I'll start throwing... I'll, yeah, I, I, I'll go off as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so we'll see you. What are we going to see you now next? Is the next program going to be April, April 7th, right? Yes, Wednesday, so April 7th. So I need 7th. to introduce, right, is going to be. Can we have a drum roll or something? Yes, drum roll. Is going to be our inaugural Vanderbilt University Medical Center Department of Cardiovascular Surgery faculty forum and the topic is going to be do we have a card for them yet david he loves when do you we ask have for a card for them that we weren't planning for not yet okay so we're gonna we'll have that we'll we'll be sending that i think we sent an advertisement out already yes. and uh that's gonna and it's gonna be on dcd donation after cardiac death mm -hmm. so we're gonna have their program uh, it's gonna be april wednesday april the 7th at 7, 7 a.m to 8 a.m mm -hmm. Followed by the Tammy Sparacino Journal Club. Followed by which we're the moving up nuggets. an hour so that we can. Yes, so it's all going to be seven to eight, eight to nine, and John, you're going to be nine to ten instead of ten to eleven. Yes. Okay. So we'll see you all April seventh, and then our spring conference is set. It's going to be really good. I'm so excited about this. The spring conference came together fantastic. Mm -hmm. We've got a guest speaker coming in. Uh, from Moscow, Dr. Kravitsky. Mm -hmm. He is a very interesting fella. He's coming here, then he's going to be leaving here, going back to Moscow. I think he's going to, you know, he's, and he's not that difficult to understand. Magic understands him a little bit better than the rest of us do. But uh, he's going to be talking about a lot of different topics, which I think people are going to find very interesting. And he mm -hmm. is really a flow measurement expert. This guy really knows his stuff. I'm very excited that he's going to be here. We'll see you all on April 7th. Thank you, and be safe. Have a good weekend. Good night.